Hello and welcome back as we continue with day one of our Smithsonian Education online conference on climate change. It's wonderful to have you with us as you could see from the uh, tracking map we had. We have people from literally all over the world. Um, last check there are people from uh, over 60 countries who had already come to uh, visit with us here at the online conference. So we know that this is an issue that affects each of us and we're glad that this community has developed in such a global way because we each have something to bring to this discussion. Our next session is about biodiversity and climate change and you're very lucky to have with, uh, with all of you remotely Francisco Dalmeyer, who is the director for the Center for Conservation, Education and Sustainability and uh, the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute at the National Zoo here uh, in Washington. I'm going to go ahead and introduce Francisco in just a moment, but I know we have some people who are joining us for the first time for this session. So let me remind you that there are three ways to share your questions and comments with us. And uh, I know that Francisco has a number of comments for each of you, um, a number of questions for each of you, but if you have questions to share with us, you can type them into the Q&A box at the lower left corner of your screen. If you're in a large group and it's difficult to reach the keyboard, but you have a cell phone handy, you can also text your messages to 99503. Just be sure to put the word chat in front of your message when you send it to 99503, and that will route your question to us. So if you're in a group and it's hard to get to the keyboard, that's a great way to interact. And lastly, if you are on Twitter, you can also send the words at poll, and again the word chat, with your message. Uh, to Twitter and we will get those messages as well. But of course the easiest way is to use the box on the left and we'll be looking for your questions as we go along. All right, don't forget we have recordings for all of the sessions that will be posted uh, within the next few hours from day one and that will uh, continue with each day of the conference so you can always go back. I'm going to go ahead now and introduce Francisco Dalmeyer who is, as I mentioned, going to talk to us about biodiversity and how it may be affected by climate change. It's good to have you here, Francisco. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jonathan, for having me. OK, uh, welcome, everybody, and thank you for participating in this great event. Uh, in my talk, I will be describing uh, some of the changes that the species and habitats uh, are, are having as we speak, and also these changes that will be happening over time, and also the sort of the geographic distribution of some species. Uh, changes in sea level rise and also what it, all of this all of this means to our planet. I will make some uh, links to some of the current activities that Smithsonian and partners are doing overseas in many international programs to try to achieve conservation at a different scales. Let me get comfortable here with this. Okay, great. Oop. Okay, perfect. Uh, society is becoming uh, more aware of the implications for climate change and we will be taking a look at a few of them in, in greater details. You can see some of the publications that have been uh, at the you know, public uh, uh, domain and also more scientific publications uh, describing many of these issues associated to climate change and the impacts on biodiversity. Okay. Some of the studies uh, indicate that uh, it will be possible that a region like uh, Washington DC, where we are now, uh, can actually become as hot as humid as North or South Carolina. Uh, you may have noticed uh, some significant changes in weather where you live. Uh, take a look uh, at this website. We have it at the virtual exhibit, and you can see a lot of the uh, potential changes that can be happening in, in your area. That's kind of interesting to, as, a, as a background information for prediction and, and monitoring of some, of some of those changes. One biological example of this change is that researchers have been observed migratory birds are arriving earlier to the spring breeding grounds. Uh, Bert mentioned some of this in the previous uh, presentation, and this is something that the Smithsonian is heavily involved in the uh, studies of migratory birds through, through our Smithsonian Migratory Bird Center. This implies that the birds are breeding and nesting earlier and could be affected by the food supply that will impact the breeding success. So many of these species are very timely organized uh, in relation to uh, a species uh, of uh, insects or a species of plants that they consume and the timing for this, those plants to be available for their breeding uh, arrivals is, is really important. Francisco, I'm kind of curious, I'm going to bring up a question uh, here for folks. 
Uh, based on an analysis of 305 bird species across North America, how many miles on average would you guess that they have shifted northward? Let's find out what people think about this. Of course, some of you may know the answer and others might be guessing, but go ahead and let us know what you think. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, from uh, 305 bird studies uh, uh, studied over you know, a period of a number of years, the average was about 35 miles. Uh, but let me give you some, some of the uh, uh, extremes or, or, or you know, the, the ones that have uh, the largest range. Like the uh, wild turkeys have chased about uh, 408 to, oh, miles or 656 kilometers uh, northward. Those are quite a quite a spread of the distance and, and achievement of the range of these species. Also, the uh, ring built uh, goal have moved about 355 miles. That is, that's about 573 kilometers uh, uh, more north. Uh, the boreal chickadee, 279 miles, uh, 449 kilometers. So it's, it's quite a quite a variation. And and this is another example how the the individual observations uh, uh, from citizens and students and, and teachers can really help to populate this kind of uh, information for monitoring. Uh, this is uh, most of the data is coming from the Audubon annual Christmas per count, uh, and the report you can find it in the web page. Also, it will be in our exhibit uh, as, uh, in the web page. Oh, it looks like I think uh, most people got that question right. By the way, okay, so. okay, <laughs> cool, cool. Yes, great. Uh, studies also report that flowers are blooming earlier, and you saw some of the uh, observations. It's one of the charts and observations that uh, Bert also mentioned. Uh, and we are observing the same patterns for North America uh, all the way to Japan. Uh, uh, most of the northern and southern hemispheres, you can see some of these changes already. Uh, Smithsonian also is heavily involved in many of these studies, also at this environmental research center in the Chesapeake area, the Smithsonian Conservation and Research Center, and also the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. We have a great network of uh, monitoring sites uh, across the uh, internationally, also across the Americas, and also in the northern latitudes, basically to study these changes of uh, variations over time. So uh, another question for you. How much earlier on the average do you think flowers are blooming? That's a really interesting question. So let's see what, what uh, we are getting here from people. And let's show you those results as they come in. So on average. How much earlier do you think that flowers are blooming? Interesting. Some people say it's uh, about a week. The leading uh, response at this point is two weeks. Would the people who said two weeks be correct or incorrect? That's correct. That's about two weeks now. And that's, that's really significant. Uh, you, you saw the picture in the earlier presentation. Uh, but it's about two weeks, and, and it looks like it's in for some species will even uh, be earlier this year. Uh, for example, the, one of the most common ones that you can, you can, many people can identify very easily is the daffodils. Uh, daffodils uh, are, you know, used to blo uh, uh, bloom, uh, blossom around the February in the 1980s, and it's, uh, it's now seen to blossom over two weeks earlier than usual. So again, the the, ac the answer to your question is about two weeks. So what kind of plants have you observed flowering earlier in your area? Do you have any, any suggestions? Do you have any comments on that? Any of the ones from the chart that you can identify or are related to your particular sites? Uh, Great. And I've put that question up just to, so that people can focus on it. On the left side, what kind of plants have you observed flowering earlier, earlier in your area? Go ahead and type them into the chat box uh, on the left. We'd love to get a sense from where you are if you've noticed anything blooming earlier. We have magnolias uh, at, uh, and crocuses at Montgomery College. Um, a lot of people are seeing crocuses as well. Yep. Cherry blossoms here in DC at the zoo, near, near the zoo. Um, we're being told from uh, reports from the west coast of Canada that everything is uh, blooming earlier. And Sarah is seeing roses blooming. In fact, some of the some of the issues with the maple uh, maple syrup production in Canada has been affected by the, because of the changes in, in temperatures, and maybe we need to move up the the the, uh, the growing uh, uh, areas for for maple even north. Another implication of uh, warmer temperatures is that glaciers melt and cause raising of, of, of the sea level. That's uh, also was mentioned before. Uh, so as sea level rises, storms and floods become more frequent. Uh, larger areas become inundated. Uh, unless greenhouse uh, uh, 
gas emissions are curved, global temperatures could climb 2 to 3 degrees Celsius by the year 2100. Uh, that's not too far away, uh, and it's, it's quite, quite a challenge that we, we have ahead. So here's another question for you. Uh, the glacier of Greenland is melting at a rate such that in, in two days there is enough water to uh, be used for the city of New York. Uh, so for how long? Interesting question. So the glacier of Greenland is melting at a rate such that in two days there is enough water for people to use in the, in the New York metropolitan area to last how long? How much water could that glacial melting provide for the metropolitan area of New York? And while you're responding to that, by the way, uh, we had a lot of responses to the uh, the blooming question, including some reports from uh, the Bahamas, where the Easter lilies are blooming uh, later, actually. Okay, well, let's see what the result is here. Interestingly, 52% uh, thought it was a month. Uh, in fact, 86% thought it was a month to a week. Would people be surprised to know the actual answer? The actual answer is one year. Uh, the, uh, I'm glad we are not at the month, even even though that is uh, that's a good answer. Uh, we may be heading that way because the the fastest speed of the of the, of the melting process. But uh, but one year, and now you can imagine the amount of water that the uh, New Yorkers use in one year, and and how much uh, uh, water would be produced by this melting process. Okay, this chart shows uh, uh, sea level uh, as measured in inches, first in New York, starting in 1856, and that is marked in red. And then in Boston, Massachusetts, starting in 1922, that's the one marked in blue. Uh, it, it goes all the way to the year 2000. In 1856, uh, sea level was set to zero to illustrate the amount of, uh, of increase over the past 150 years. Uh, we chose an increase of 10 to 15 inches. That would be about 25 to 80, uh, 38 centimeters. Uh, our virtual exhibit posts a website which offers you more information about rising sea levels. Uh, it's, it's from a UK uh, research team. This is this is this is very important because uh, this will affect a lot of the uh, areas, including coastal areas and critical places where we live. Here you have a. Uh, uh, Population cities, uh, we have Washington, D.C., we have New York, and we have San Francisco. Uh, these areas will suffer a significant flooding due to sea level rises because of temperature and increases. Of course, we have a lot of biodiversity associated with the coastal areas and the areas where those uh, floods will happen. And especially for us sitting here today, we won't be able to do this broadcasting uh, uh, from this location anymore because we, it could be underwater. Uh, the frequency of a storm will also increase uh, some of which we have seen and others we can can even imagine that will happen. So uh, if you've been reading probably the papers and the internet and the news for the last few days, so what significant floods are you familiar with recently? I think there is one that is, is moving, a storm that is moving in a direction of a country in a different continent at the moment and will be hitting there in a few days or so. Well, feel free to let us know the location, geographic, regional, um, of any floods that you're familiar with recently over the last five years. Go ahead and type them in to the chat box. And um, we have some reports from Quebec, the Philippines, Georgia, and the United States. All right. This is a true citizen science here, having everybody report in from around the globe. Well, it's so. really great, yeah, because we have uh, some issues in, in the Philippines, uh, and we had just a storm that went by, and no, another one that is coming. We have the uh, floodings in the southwest, so it's, it's, it's all over. I mean, the, the frequencies and intensities is obviously changing and, and increasing, and that's, that's, we're going to see more of that uh, over time. So also globally, uh, the average sea level has risen between 4 to 8 inches, that's uh, 10 to 20 centimeters, over the past century. That's uh, 100 years we have you know, this kind of modest increase. Uh, recent sea level rise has primarily been caused of, by thermal expansion of the oceans and they warm. As you know, the, as you warm up the, the water, the water will expand and will require more space. So soon the actual amount of water in the ocean will increase as the, as the melting of glaciers and ice caps continues. It is predicted that sea level rise uh, uh, by another 4 to 35 inches, uh, 10 to 89 centimeters, in the next uh, 100 years. So that's a significant change from the initial you know, 10 to 20 centimeters uh, from the last century. 
Uh, uh, and the, the picture here illustrates some of the areas in, in Texas and the coastal area of Texas. Texas have a very extensive, uh, important uh, uh, sites for wetlands and important areas for conservation of uh, wildlife and species uh, that are kind of endangered species in some, some cases. So many of those areas will be flooded. Uh, many of those uh, protected areas that we have for many of those species more likely will, will disappear. By the way, we, we have a, a, a question here where there's a, there's a number of questions uh, coming in. Um, but here's a, a question. Um, there are a lot of people asking about the local impact uh, in their particular area. We have questions uh -huh. about the impact on Texas, the impact uh, in the Bahamas, Venezuela, um, and obvious, of obvious concern to people from each of their respective areas. What kind of, uh, obviously we can't go through each and every location, but what kind of mm -hmm. guidance do you have for people looking to find out? Uh, you can check uh, some of the information will be in our uh, website. Also will be uh, in a NOAA website have uh, some of the data. The IPCC, the International Program on Climate Change, have some of that data and some of the predictions. Uh, some areas obviously will become uh, drier and also the, ex uh, the temperature will go higher like, uh, like in, in, in South America in the Amazon the frequency of fires will increase and the, and the potential shift of uh, areas with uh, subtropical forests to, to uh, desert or to more uh, dry areas will also occur. Uh, you also have uh, shifting in, in location, like, like a movement of uh, the line of trees or the line of uh, insects uh, colonizing new areas in the north, in North America, will also happen. You also will get areas that will be more uh, uh, wetter. So, but you have to look at the specific location where you are. Uh, what, we, what, we, what could be the implications for that? So, basically, in one century, oceans have risen three to four feet, about one meter. So, I mean, that's going to be much more what is pre predicted from today. So, what do you think the answer is? Uh, uh, basically, uh, gl glaciers uh, uh, melt. Uh, basically. A significant amount every year, so, and we know that that could be a, a significant impact on New York and places like that, as you saw in the previous pictures. So uh, let me let me give you the, the, the question here. In in one century, ocean have risen to three to four feet. If all the glaciers were were to melt, how many feet are projected for the oceans to rise? So that's that's the question. Yeah. We have it here on the screen. For about two to one, people are thinking that it's 23 to 26 feet. Would they be Would they be right? That's right. That's that's the right. Uh, that, that's 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 significant, especially for people associated to coastal areas uh, uh, and are are, are very uh, close to the to the water lines. Great. All right. Okay. Let's let's go to this one. Let's take a look at this uh, uh, video. Do I? Click it, or you uh, I'll go ahead okay. and bring that up okay. for everybody, Francisco, okay. and we'll uh, we'll put that up on the screen here, and you can tell us what we're what we're looking at. Yeah, but by 1980, this is uh, provided by by NOAA and also NASA. Uh, there was an estimated three to four million square uh, miles. That's about six to uh, seven million square kilometers of ice covering the Arctic Arctic Circle. Uh, by 2007. NASA calculated that the ice cover had reduced to almost half of that. So that's really significant. So you can see how the, 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 the trend is uh, basically uh, year by year. And when you have the, the period of uh, winter, when you get uh, the accumulation of ice and then the reduction of the ice. You can now imagine the amount of water melted from the glacier that have been pumping into the ocean and the type of consequences for the, for the planet, for people, for, bi for biodiversity. So we all, we all been affected in a way by, by this process. And, and that's something that we are watching very carefully, you know, this process of melting and is the Okay, let's do this. So is climate change the only danger to biodiversity? Well, uh, climate change is only one of the drivers. Uh, so a question for you. What are some of the uh, uh, global drivers uh, negatively impacting biodiversity in your opinion? In other words, uh, what are some of the global disturbances that can put ecosystems uh, of balance? We'll take a look uh, at some of the answers quickly here. Yeah, so uh, there's the question. Global uh, cl climate change is only one driver impacting biodiversity. What are some of the other global disturbances that can negatively impact biodiversity? Uh, we're hearing things about deforestation, um, habitat destruction, which fits in that category as well. Um, invasive species, thank you. Um, coal mining, says Sarah. Thanks for sharing that with us, Sarah. Um, we're also hearing about 
um, conflict, wild human and wildlife conflict. Excuse me, overpopulation, which is a theme that a few people have brought up. Uh, questions about the human population. Um, so, thank you. Well, you are, you are right. You know, all of the all of the ones that you mentioned, uh, invasive species are really important. Pollution is a big one. Uh, and and basically habitat change, habitat changes, habitat transformation, uh, the way we are moving uh, uh, habitats uh, or, or environments to one kind of uh, forest or one kind of wetland to a completely different scenario or, or, or urban uh, uh, setup. So this chart illustrates, for example, the habitat change may be even more dangerous than climate change to biodiversity. So it's the combination. It's the combination of having the, the climate change, uh, the, climate, the, the, the warming, and all those uh, climate impacts associated to the global disturbances that are induced by people in many different fronts. So as you can imagine, uh, all of these will uh, definitely compromise the, uh, our ability to, to maintain a sustainable uh, areas uh, for conservation and for, for people's use. What about other disturbers and events such as fires? Fires are extremely challenging, and you probably been uh, uh, tuned to the different uh, media outlets and how the fires in California and other places in the world are affecting the landscape. Uh, in 2003, large fires drew considerable attention as ecological and human dynamics collide. The size and number of western forest fires has increased substantially since 1985. And these increases were linked to early spring snow melt and higher spring in summer air temperatures. So that's a, that's a really bad combination. You get a, a very high or higher temperatures than usual, and you get a very dry uh, uh, a season. And that that's a you know fantastic opportunity for the fires to basically trigger in in, in some kinds in a way that is uh, sometimes unmanageable. Wildfires have dramatically increased all over the world. This chart illustrates the frequency of wildfires for the last 60 years. And this is really critical. You can see in, in the Americas the, the tremendous increase that we have as a, as a way you know, uh, in many areas of managing the land. So we manage the land uh, uh, by creating fires. That way we create in, in some areas some green pasture that will provide the food for some of the cattle ranching operations and things like that. Francisco, there's, we're going to put up a question for the audience, and while we ask them a true or false question about whether trees generate 50% of the rainfa rainfall in the Amazon, is that true or false? Um, there's a question here from Nathan uh, in Cleveland saying, is the tradition of fire suppression a major cause of catastrophic wildfires? Is that something? Yeah, I mean, it, it's a combination. It's a very, very good question because in some of the areas, uh, fires have been an, a natural process uh, for maintaining diversity and for maintaining a healthy population and regeneration. But those are usually controlled and managed uh, fires. In many cases, when you have a large-scale suppression for many, many years, the build up, uh, build up of uh, organic material reach uh, levels that could be extremely dangerous, especially when you have... Uh, uh, big droughts, and then we have you have higher temperatures that basically creates the perfect uh, 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 the perfect uh, fire, you know, because you have all the conditions there for large scale ones like, like the ones in California, where the you know low uh, humidity and very high temperatures provide, and plus the winds, you know, the effect of the winds that that create that's that's really devastating. Plus the effect that it produces on the CO2, the increase of CO2. So the 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 fact is that fires are increasing in many ways. Many of these fires are unmanageable, and many of uh, because of the scale that they are taking, and uh, they are moving into new territories with the drier uh, areas in the rainforest or so dry periods in the rainforest during each year. Uh, we are getting uh, the frequency of fires increasing in areas that didn't have fires before. So let's let's go back to the answer. The answer to the question: uh, uh, Trees generate 50% of the uh, rainfall in the Amazon. That's that's absolutely true, and and um, most of you have a great uh, uh, response for that. And that's one of the issues that we are discussing that. Uh, if, if temperatures, as predicted, will dry the, the, the big uh, chunks of rainforest in, in Southeast Asia, uh, uh, Central Africa, and the Amazon, uh, we're going to have a, a, a transformation of uh, major forests that produce uh, capture uh, uh, processes for CO2 and also for species diversity. And those areas can be transformed to, to drier places. Francisco, before you continue, we have a question coming in from Sanjay, who is in Chennai in India, who says, um, can the ecosystem adapt to the problem you're describing here, or why can't the ecosystem adapt? 
Ecosystems have adapted through uh, the history of, of, uh, of the planet. Uh, uh, the issue is that the speed of adaptation and the, and the uh, uh, availability of spaces for, for species, uh, for habitats, for plants and animals to move and colonize are, are reduced because uh, people management. So the places that we have today as a, as a protected areas may be no that relevant for those species anymore uh, over time because the shift in, in, in uh, temperature, humidity uh, will uh, and season uh, variations will basically uh, create new environments that that uh, uh, that particular area won't be able to, to support. So anyway, yes, adaptation is a, is a natural process, but but the scale and the speed that we are pushing this adaptation nowadays is, is really fast. Let's go, let's go now to the floods. Uh, some of the most severe weather events, such as more frequent heavy precipitation during winter, could become more frequent with results in increased uh, risk for large-scale flooding and loss of topsoils uh, due to erosion. That's a, that's a big issue. Also, uh, in addition to floodings, you have the, the uh, spread of uh, uh, insects and the and the in many cases the pathogens that those insects will carry with them and will transport to the different environments. This creates infectious diseases and possible destructions on not only the host species but also the entire ecosystem. We have a tremendous issue right now with uh, species of beetles, uh, uh, invasive species of beetles introduced in some of the uh, uh, forests in the in the U.S. and uh, and, and Canada. And because of the uh, warmer temperatures during the winter, the beetles uh, uh, don't die during the winter and can pretty much survive uh, uh, those uh, periods of cold weather, which uh, creates a tremendous problem for the expansion of those uh, uh, beetles and the diseases that they cause uh, that produce immortality in large areas of the, of the Northwest. You may have heard of a uh, disturbance uh, called invasive species. We have one of the, one of the uh, colors basically mentioned invasive species. And, uh, invasive species are non-indigenous species of plants and animals that adversely affect the habitats they in invade economically, environmentally, or ecologically. So can you name, uh, it's a question for you, can you name some invasive species near where you live, either plant or animals? And people are already responding. We're hearing um, talk about zebra mussels. Uh-huh, perfect. That's a great answer. The yeah. ash borer. Uh-huh. The kudzu. Uh-huh. The Eurasian milfoil. Uh -huh. I'm learning a lot. <laughs> the lionfish. Yeah. Um, the purple loosestrife. You know, I have to rely on Francisco because some of you could be making up some names here, and I don't know. That's why we. Have <laughs> I may not even know some of those myself. <laughs> uh, the, the, somebody mentioned here. Linda mentioned about the fire ants. The, those the fire ants are a really a really tragic example of an invasive species that is occupying a niche that is extremely. Uh, challenging to 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 manage. Uh, uh, we have a major invasion of fire ants in the in the south uh, of the United States, uh, southeast United States. Australia have a lot of issues with uh, with fire ants. Africa uh, recently and uh, a few years ago, we we discovered fire ants from Brazil in Central Africa, and, uh, which creates a major problem for for the local species, not only other insects, but also the larger animals. We have uh, leopards with uh, uh, lacerations of the cornea because of the fire ants. We have uh, in one hectare of forest in some areas in, in the rainforest in, in Central Africa, you can have uh, more than 100 species of ants. In the places where you have the, uh, the invasive Brazilian uh, fire ants, you don't only have that, that uh, invasive species. So. That's a, that's a tragic issue of how invasive species can transform the landscape and affect uh, many of the animals and plants that we share the, the, the environment with. What a collection of invasive species we have just curated here with our group from across the globe. So thank you for contributing to that eye-opening um, listing. And this is a very, very important issue that uh, we are able to educate people about invasive and non-native species. Many species can be naturalized and will be part of the environment, and it's fine. But it's, it's the ones that will take uh, aggressive, uh, aggressively over the, the, the uh, native ecosystems that uh, are creating some of the major issues. So that's something important because we need to, we need to manage those and we need to be able to uh, preserve the integrity of uh, environments and areas that we have protected because the native uh, diversity of species. 
So uh, global climate change may lead to, to the retreat of some of the invasive species. That could be the opposite eff effect, you know. You have some, some plants because the, the, the changes in the uh, warmer, uh, changes toward warmer or, or, or cooler areas, uh, uh, that, that effect will be able to, to provide some opportunity for reclamation, res restoration of areas, and eradication of some of these uh, invasive plants and animals. Another uh, important uh, uh, disturbance uh, is hurricanes. Increasing the hurricane activity, such as during the season of 20, 20, 2004 and five, that you are probably very familiar with, uh, may be part of the natural cycle uh, uh, for the Earth. However, it's, it's, it's uh, extremely devastating and it's creating a, a major uh, transformation of landscape, habitats, and, and species uh, environments that, that we need to, uh, to manage somehow. And of course, all of this uh, for the hurricanes and, the, and, the, and people from the Caribbean, this is a major transformation of the uh, lifestyle and the way how people have to adapt in the process of, of change. Hurricanes, in addition to the destruction of uh, human houses and plants and animals, uh, also provides a, a lot of issues. Uh, in, in some cases, we have uh, a negative effects associated to uh, 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 losing agricultural land because of the salinization of those places. And the, and the difficulties of restoring many of those areas after you get uh, major hurricanes. Uh, you also have uh, uh, the issues with uh, wind storms. Uh, that's a major uh, component also of these uh, changes in climate and affecting biodiversity. Increased fre frequency of uh, small-scale winds events, uh, such, such as tornadoes, can create very large uh, patches of damage which can change ecosystem level processes. Uh, so here's another question for you. Do you think that climate change increases or decreases the, the frequency of landslides? And while people are responding to this question about landslides, Francisco, there was a, an interesting question about invasive species, a couple really, that I wanted to just quickly jump to. One is from Rachel who says, would animals that are changing their ranges due to climate change be considered invasive species? That's a very, very good question. Uh, the, 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 the important issue is that some of them probably will. Some of, so, so we have, we have uh, major uh, uh, expansion of many uh, species. For example, you have the, 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 uh, the coyote, the coyote in, 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 in North America that is, is, is pretty much now through all the way in, 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 the, in, uh, in North America all the way to, uh, to Panama. And, and it's probably moving south uh, once they figure it out how to cross the, the, the Panama Canal. And as, as we know, the coyotes are, are pretty smart and they will figure it out. So we also have uh, uh, migratory birds. Migratory birds are, are a, a basically use the pattern in, in the case of North America uh, to basically go north for the breeding grounds. So if the breeding ground is providing the, the support in terms of the plants and the seeds or the, the, the food source that those species will require, will be a significant movement and probably impact of those species. We have uh, a snow goose at, at an issue here in the, in the East Coast. The population are extremely high. They, they, they are moving uh, to a wide variety of wetlands that they, they didn't used to occupy before. So yes, I mean, they are, some of them will be considered invasive species. Some of them will be considered basically expanding ranges. And, and the effects of those expansion of ranges, we, we probably won't know yet. Great. Thank you, Francisco, and thanks for that good question. And by the way, I think in the process you also gave some uh, enlightenment to Carol's good question about the migration of a specific species like Canadian geese to southern New England. So thank you for that. Yeah, great. So, well, the, 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 basically, yes. I mean, the, 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 uh, the answer is both. Uh, uh, landslides uh, uh, activity can both increase or decrease depending on the direction uh, or, or, or change of precipitation and temperature. So if you have uh, if you have uh, issues uh, uh, if you have areas that will be drier that probably will be a, a great benefit uh, in terms of landslides. If you are in some of the areas of the Andes with extremely rough terrain and with with a major issue with landslides uh, in a regular basis, and the area will become drier, that will be in a way a, a benefit for some of those areas because the the frequency will be reduced. But uh, but you know the o the other the other the other component is also uh, the same. You will have you will get increasing in many other areas that. Maybe you don't have uh, that frequency at the moment. We also have the uh, ice storms. That's another, another global disturbance uh, uh, and have been increasing in frequency for the last 50 years. 
an artifact that shapes vegetation composition, structure, and condition over very wide areas. Uh, and that's uh, very tough in, in many of the northern parts uh, sometimes of the year because the intensity and the, and the frequency that those happen, even though sometimes the seasons are getting shorter. Uh, drought as well is yet another global disturbance. And that, as uh, we talked before about this, uh, drought in combination with higher temperatures can be a major issue. Droughts are important because uh, 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 to manage because of the water resources that people will need. And, and the combination of the, the water and moist that will generate uh, 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 the appropriate environment for, uh, environment for, the, for, the, for the trees or for the forest or for the particular environment with, where many species in, inhabit. So that's, a, that's an issue that, that is going to be happening in some of the areas. And you pr can probably also check that on the website for the different locations where you are. And we have a question here for our participants. Uh, drought can weaken trees. In what ways do you think forests are impacted as a result? Let's find out what people uh, think about that. We can see the traffic here, all the questions. And wow, we had 97% going to all of the above. And and that's basically it, you know. Uh, all of the, you know, the drought can affect trees in, in many different ways. and, and uh, Especially, you know, weakening uh, the uh, the ability of the uh, tree to react to in infestations, and then the the uh, uh, diseases that that will uh, bring, uh, the creation of areas that will be dry enough to create the combined effect with the fires, and then the uh, ultimate trigger that is probably could be even worse than fires that will be the invasive species uh, that will colonize new areas and, and probably change the habitat completely. Great. I would refer to next to the uh, uh, National Geographic uh, channel that produced a DVD that illustrates what sorts of disturbances can happen with a simple increase of one degree Celsius for a total of six degrees. This is a great uh, this is a great movie that you probably need to see at some point because uh, uh, it will be it will be connected in our virtual exhibit. And you can also see uh, what will be the effect over time. You know, what, what each degree, what, what could happen, and what could be these different potential scenarios for, for uh, a prediction, forecasting from, uh, from, 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 the, from people, uh, mitigation, and adaptation. What are the things that we need to adapt for this kind of uh, situation? So take a look at that. That will be a very educational component that you can use in the, in the schools. So now, with now the big question, you know, uh, Berg uh, uh, gave us some uh, some uh, beginning of uh, uh, process of to think about how we can change. What are the things that we can do to make things better uh, for for us and for the planet and for for everybody that will be living in this planet for the many more years after we live? Uh, we need to find ways to adapt and find solutions that manage impacts over the long term. Adaptation and adapting can uh, mean locating to new areas. So basically, how do we, how we, do we plan our our new areas, our new cities, our new uh, 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 agricultural places, or, or how we're going to adapt to these drier places or wetter places? How are we going to do uh, manage the conservation of habitats and species that we already have planned and put in the in in the maps as a national parks or wildlife refuge or or areas of conservation concern? How can we repackage this and realign these protected areas that will help us to achieve a significant change and future uh, in order to warranty that society will have a diverse and rich resources for the future generations? So adaptation is a, is a crit critical issue so, uh, and also that we work uh, very closely together with mitigation. You have that uh, uh, in, in many of the reports. You will see that uh, the IPCC will be talking about adaptation and mitigation because we have to do both, in addition to to, to reducing the emissions and uh, in addition to reducing or changing people's behaviors in the way we we use uh, energy. So complexity comes into play when species and habitats change at the local scale. That's that's related to one of the questions that we had before. What happened when we have this beautiful national park set aside for tiger conservation in, in Southeast Asia? And then we have this fantastic uh, uh, process of changing that is occurred, and the habitat is not there anymore. The prey are, are, are dying or changing or moving. Uh, so how do we adapt and how do we uh, uh, pose that question also associated to this uh, could be the migratory birds that we spoke before uh, that are expanding the range uh, sometimes on a, a very large scale. That's a really fascinating point. Uh, we're setting up conservation areas, national parks, 
and the species and wildlife that they're designed to protect are, in some cases, moving out of the range that we've defined. So that's fascinating. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very complex issue because, uh, 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 as, as the previous uh, uh, caller mentioned before, we have a number of uh, areas set aside and, and we need adaptation. Adaptation will requ re require north to south, south to north uh, gradients for species and animals to, to change. Not just people will be changing, but also you know animals and plants. And also we require uh, altitudinal gradients. You have lower lands, higher elevations. So you got you're going from, you know, a species moving north or moving south, depending on the temperature, depending on that range, specific range that they will need for for survival. So one example of aligning conservation areas is uh, is uh, uh, what is called the Mesoamerican Biological Corridor. You can also check that on the web page. This is a concept of biological corridors that has been uh, it's been around for, for for some time now, but it's extremely important because this will allow us to do the adaptation and to do some of the mitigation in order to allow people biodiversity to be able to move in in directions that will allow again diversity sustainability and a management of natural resources. Uh, basically, the corridor is a cluster of protected areas and adjacent land with facilities uh, uh, that will facilitate the conservation of a variety of species and habitats. So this is the way we need to think about uh, a future uh, conservation, future management of species, future of protected areas, and how wh what is that design that society wants about biodiversity? What is that design that we would like to see our children and grandchildren to inherit from us will be an, a planet with uh, multiple protected areas at the you know altitudinal gradients. Will be corridors that will, will allow species to to evolve and to adapt and to change over time, to 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 basically deal with these issues of change. What is that 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 our generation is basically defining for the future? Another another example uh, is uh, uh, that we've been working uh, at the Smithsonian is uh, the management, uh, strategic plan and uh, management for uh, developing areas that will be interconnected for the protection of species and the range of species in a wide variety of, of places. For example, this, in this particular case, it's in Central Africa in the country of, of Gabon. Uh, as you know, the Central Africa is, uh, and this particular place, is one of the areas in the world where you still have very large population of, of uh, African megafauna. And megafauna is something that you don't see anymore in, in most of the environments, especially in the tropics, because most of the animals are gone because of hunting or, or, or development or many other reasons. So this is uh, one of the last areas in the world where we can do that. And it's, it's basically the combination of the protected areas, managed areas, people's behaviors, education programs. So, so it's, 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 it's beyond the, the traditional biology, how to protect or manage species. It's basically what do we do to put this puzzle together to develop the best possible approach when we have multiple stakeholders working together to achieve conservation? Francisco, there's a number of uh, fantastic questions coming in. Uh, briefly, because I, I imagine this is a, a topic that, that could require a lengthy answer, but how are such biological corridors being created? That is, that is, a, that is a very, very big question. So the biodiversity um, protected area management or wildlife conservation, uh, the, in, in that process, the biology is the easiest part. It's basically people. You have to work with multiple stakeholders. You have to work with people from the local areas. You have to work with people from the government. You have to work with people from the development sector, uh, meaning it could be government, could be private. Uh, and you, can, you have to work with science. So you can use science, education, a stakeholders engagement in order to map these areas. Basically, uh, you have to provide uh, a, a solution or a strategy that will allow local people to be able to make a living, to have a decent uh, living, and be able to be able to uh, uh, use the area sustainable. At the same time, how to put all these uh, these pieces together with a number of stakeholders. So basically, it's engagement on a number of people in many different fronts, getting them to work together toward this concept and basically put the picture over time because for many areas, uh, critical areas from conservation in the world, you have the issue that you know people have to wake up every morning and figure it out what am I going to eat today and how am I going to feed my family. So that's the only question that for many people that they have and they, can, they have to address daily and they cannot think at the longer term. 
So basically, it's, it's a stakeholder consultation process, mapping the areas, putting the science behind, and working together with multiple stakeholders to develop the best strategy for long-term conservation and biological corridors. Thank you, Francisco. It is also essential that we base our decisions on science. To be able to better forecast and manage future species and ecosystem changes, I will share with you a, a, a very uh, recent example. It's a recent example for the last uh, five to seven years. It's, a, it's the National Ecological Observatory Network. Uh, it's called NEON, N-E-O-N, and it's a National Science Foundation funded initiative. This is a great program that's going to transform the way we do science, we, we, we do ecology, we do forecasting. So I think you know, for education purposes, educators that are, are tuned up for this, for this conference, you guys need to go back to the, to the website and check the neoninc.org because this, this is good. So basically the network is designing a continental scale ecological monitoring program for understanding and forecasting the impacts of climate change land use change and invasive species on ecology. So as Smithsonian is, 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 will, is heavily involved in this process or right now the planning for the NEON, we will have a, a, a NEON core site that will be located at the Smithsonian Conservation and Research Center in, in, in Front Royal, Virginia, and also linked to the uh, uh, Smithsonian Environmental Research Center, plus a global uh, national network and eventually, hopefully, a global network. Um, the NEON initiative to further example, uh, to further the example, uh, we have 20 interlinked observatory sites across the continental United States, also Hawaii, Puerto Rico, uh, which uh, will provide a wealth of data for ecological forecasting. That's what we need. That's where we got many of the answers and the questions that we are getting from, from, the, uh, from the participants in this conference is, uh, well, what is the prediction? How, wh wh what's going to happen? How is it going to change my area? Well, this, this is it. We have to use science, very sound science, and education to be able to do those predictions, to be able to transmit and translate the science that we all do to the educator, to the teacher, to the to the student, in order to, 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 to make predictions, to mitigate what we want to mitigate, to adapt, to change. This kind of ecological monitoring will help us to understand and predict climate variability, the impacts of human activities on biodiversity, changes in freshwater resources, and the ecolo ecological aspect of infectious diseases. That is extremely important. We keep talking about the swine flu. The swine flu is only one of the many things that, that are out there in terms of infectious diseases. And we need to be able to forecast this better. We need to be able to anticipate uh, uh, this better, how this, those could be affecting the society and how we can basically do adapt to that and, and provide the appropriate measurements for society to be able to survive. So uh, uh, I'm going to get my rough red flag here from Jonathan pretty soon. So in summary, uh, uh, we need to approach conservation and sustainable development strategically. Uh, to do this, we need an interdisciplinary approach that al allows for a comprehensive ecological monitoring strategy. This strategy will enable society make better mitigation and adaptation decisions based on sound science. And then we need a complementary component. This forecasting mechanism, uh, the ecological monitoring forecasting mechanism, has to be hand in hand with the education programs. The education programs are the ones that will be transmitting this um, tremendous amount of information, translating from sometimes very complicated uh, scientific algorithms to, to society, and for society to, to, be, to be able to make the best decisions, best decision for, for people, best decision for the environment, and especially best decision for the future generations that will inherit this, this, this planet. Thank you, Francisco. Fantastic, and you're you're getting some uh, rave reviews for your for your uh, for your walk through this important topic. There's a number of questions. I'm going to mm -hmm. try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, this is a question that goes back to the concept of adaptation. And Melinda asked, "How much time do most species need to adapt to a new region to know what, or even to know that they need to move?" Well, uh, uh, that is a very good question because there are some species that they don't have the, the environment to move to the next step or to adapt or to change. And uh, unfortunately, we are seeing the, uh, uh, many of those in areas that are very isolated because the, the, the landscape has been transformed and the habitat is, is uh, no big enough for them to, to, to expand. Uh, for example, we have area, areas in the high Andes. Uh, right now, we are dealing with about 35 species of, of conservation concern. 
these are about 30 to 35 species that are about to go to the cliff because of human changes, because the habitat has been transformed completely, and because of uh, impacts of issues associated to climate change. Uh, and other, other species are really, really plastic. So uh, an example of the, the, the very flex, the, the flexibility, the most flexible ones in many cases are invasive species. You have the starlings, you have the pigeons, you have these beetles coming into the into the forest in the in the north sea. So so the more flexible some of these species are, the easier they will be colonizing and moving into new territories. The the house sparrows that came to the U.S. Uh, 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 from England they are all over all over. I remember you know 30, 30 year plus years ago there were uh, starlings as house sparrows arriving in in, in Nebraska uh, in the way west. And nowadays, you can basically go all over the U.S. and find, you know, uh, house sparrows from from Europe. So anyway, it, it's uh, there will be the whole range. There will be species that we will have to give them the hand. We'll give them to give them the choice and the technology that we use to be able to bring them back or to keep them in the process. And we do a lot of that at the Smithsonian Conservation and Research Center. Also, uh, uh, many of those will will. Uh, uh, sadly, uh, we'll be able. You know, we have to disappear because uh, we don't have habitats anymore. So we have a few of those species in captivity that they don't have uh, habitats in, in the in the in the places where they belong because of uh, human, uh, because of uh, hunting, or because of many many reasons. So it's a it's a it's an issue of society. What is the responsibility that we have, and how we are going to address the issue of conservation of species? For the future generations, do we need to keep them? Do we want all of them? How many do we want to have left for our children and children's children to be able to enjoy or, or use? Thank you. Um, I'm going to sneak in a couple of lightning round questions, okay? And then we're going to give people about an hour break before our next session. Um, we have a few questions about underwater life, and I know that, as I mentioned earlier, we have a couple of sessions uh, on, I believe, day three, in which we'll be talking about coral reefs. Um, but we have a, one question that involves mar marine beings being affected by global warming. And similarly, we had a question about um, phytoplankton in the oceans. Will global climate change affect the oxygen-producing phytoplankton in the oceans? A word or two about underwater. Right? Yeah, well, I, I don't want to get too much into underwater because uh, my colleague is going to be uh, speaking uh, uh, about that topic and extensively. Uh, but you have, again, you have the, uh, the, the uh, spectrum there. You have the... The issue of, of uh, uh, the ocean as a, as a big uh, garbage dump, okay? So the transformation that we are doing in terms of pollution, in terms of uh, uh, changing the, the, uh, the environment is, is really dramatic at, at the level of the oceans. We have uh, major issues going on with the warming temperatures and the coral reef, the survival of the coral reef. So we have areas that are, you know, in, you, you, they, they may look nice, but the diversity of species that you have there is, is a fraction that it used to be before. Uh, we have areas that are, uh, the, the warming is not good uh, at, the, at the levels that may be happening to support the coral reef uh, life that, that where we, you know, I personally would like to, would like to see and would like to, to see for many more generations. So, yeah, it's a, it's a whole spectrum of, of uh, uh, many areas. Uh, in addition to that, you also have very good examples of uh, uh, people management that have been very successful. We have areas where people have, 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 have uh, developed areas for conservation. We have in the U.S. you have the Channel Islands. Channel Islands is a fantastic network of protected marine areas that have uh, basically brought back many of the species that, that we depleted at the levels almost that were gone. Like we had the Avalon was almost gone. The sea urchin, because of demands of, of, of uh, people for the consumption of sea urchin, were almost gone, and so on. So you have the same issues in Galapagos, uh, Galapagos Islands, and other examples of protection and, and, and good management that also have been through several cycles like that. And you have some private companies heavily involved in, in uh, doing conservation and sustainable development, really engaged in making a difference in marine, marine areas. There is a whole new area. When you talk about the energy industry, most of the exploration and future of the energy industry will be development at the uh, deep seas, uh, areas that we have uh, explored very little. Uh, they have a great diversity, are really important to society, and then uh, probably the energy industry will be uh, very important in help us to, to study those areas and to come up with solutions that will help us to achieve uh, sustainable economic development and conservation for the future generations. 
Thank you, Francisco. Every answer you give sounds like the uh, you, you're such a way with words, a beautiful summation that I'm always hesitant to ask another question. But I'm going to just uh, end with a comment that came in from uh, one of our participants, uh, and it's a, a comment from uh, someone at the uh, World Bank who thank you for joining us, who is thankful that you mentioned uh, what people can do at a, a local uh, level to uh, respond to these issues. So um, thanks and. And I'm seeing that that's being seconded from others as well. So uh, please join me, if you haven't already, as many of you have, in thanking Francisco. We do see that there are a number of other great questions, uh, a few of which I know will be addressed by a number of our um, later speakers. So we hope you'll continue to tune in. Do remember that we'll be posting recordings for all of these sessions. We had a few questions about sharing this with colleagues. Absolutely, you can share this. Uh, um, these are, of course, wide open. And we do encourage you to um, share the sessions. and even have your uh, friends and colleagues log into the discussion area and share their thoughts in there as well. Francisco Delmeyer from the National Zoo, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a great pleasure. And please join us in, in uh, achieving conservation and sustainable development.